Hey boys and girls, welcome to Mineral Live. We're out here in uh, beautiful Vancouver and uh, we're at Cometco, uh, but really Recyclico is the company that we're really uh, interested in seeing. And today we're gonna be talking about something that everybody seems to be interested in and that is the recycling of lithium ion batteries. So let's go in and have a look. Hi, my name is Joey John. I'm the uh, Vice President of Chemeco Research. Uh, I am uh, one of the co-inventor of the recycle process. Hi there, my name is Norm Chow. I'm a hydrometallurgist. I'm the President of Chemeco Research and I guess the first inventor of the recyclical process. Uh, we're an R&D contractor for Recyclico. My name is uh, Zarko Maselgia and I'm the CEO and Director of Recyclico. Um, I'm excited to show you what we got here together with uh, our Cometco team. Great. I'm Shihim Ali, I'm with Recyclico. I'm the CFO and the Director of uh, Recyclico. I'm Tony Mitchell, I'm the Director of Marketing for Recyclico Battery Materials. How our relationship came to be is way back when the company was originally named American Manganese. Uh, working here with the Cometco team, uh, we developed a process that was ended up being patented for the extraction of manganese from low-grade resources, hence the name American Manganese. So, you know, we have a history in mining projects, um, and that was around the 2008-2012 uh, time frame. Uh, that project never ended up going to full uh, production, but we still held on to those patents. And it was really Norm here who, in around 2015-16, recognized the parallels between the manganese process and seeing this trend of lithium ion batteries and the, how the cathode material is quite similar uh, to the, the material we were dealing with on the manganese mine as well. Um, and then Norm, I don't know if you want to come to yeah, well, how you explain that. Thanks, thanks for the intro, Zarko. Yeah, we um, basically did a significant amount of work for um, American manganese at the time, which became recyclical. Uh, it was, they had a, basically a, uh, a mine in Arizona. It was the largest uh, manganese deposit in North America, but it was low grade. And uh, that mine has been mined uh, and put in production uh, during World War II for um, wartime, wartime efforts, um, basically to recover manganese for steel making. Um, so the U.S. Builder Mines did a significant amount of work on that, on that uh, technology to recover manganese from a low grade ore. Uh, and Moving on to modern times, we had access to modern technology that technologies that they didn't have back then. So um, we um, improved the economics of the recovery. Um, we filed for, filed for patents. We were issued patents on the technology, and um, the metals prices dropped. So the mine kind of went, the project kind of went dormant for a while. Um, and then back in 2016, I was just scanning through research papers as I as I normally do. So I'm, I'm a scientist. And I saw one paper where it showed cobalt and manganese being extracted the same way using the same chemicals that we use for the American manganese process and a light bulb hit. And I thought, wow, we can use that technology for recycling lithium ion batteries because cobalt is like the skeleton that holds the lithium in a, in a cathode material. And this is before Model 3 or before everything became mainstream, but this light bulb hit and uh, right away, I phoned the former CEO of American Manganese, Larry Ray, and explained what I just came across. I think, I think I could use your technology for recycling lithium ion batteries. What do, you, what do you think? And he's really not in the field. And uh, he asked me to write a white paper. So I wrote a white paper. And um, he went out and got some financing. And um, we did some early stage um, laboratory testing, basically. And uh, everything worked out exactly as predicted. Um, the waste battery material is actually a very good resource to process all the way to recycling the valuable metals that go back into making batteries. So that's, that's the whole history of it. Yeah, and since 2016 we've scaled from that original concept to uh, bench scale work, uh, pilot plant work, and what you'll see is the demonstration plant work. And now we've also signed our first commercial joint venture. So we've come a long way, uh, you know, technology takes time to scale and perfect and uh, I think uh, 
uh, the viewers will be quite excited with what they see. We, we basically um, do a lot of scientific research on extraction of, I'd say, almost every commercial metal uh, from gold, silver, cobalt, manganese, lithium. Um, there's a manganese project here. But um, the reason why this is in Vancouver is because in Canada, our country's kind of been built on resource resources, resource recovery. Right. And we're talking about going back to 150 years. And the university here, University of British Columbia, is one of the top universities in the world in hydrometallurgy, extractive metallurgy, just from that long history. Um, so I think Vancouver also has the greatest number of mining head offices in the world. So <laughs> kind, of, kind of the under the radar, people don't know um, um, pieces of information that, that's not well known, but it's, um, that's the reason why we're here. Um, another uh, very little known piece of tech, uh, information is Vancouver actually produced the first commercial lithium ion battery. It was a U University of British Columbia uh, technology. And um, basically, uh, one of the pioneers of a Canadian mining company, his name was Norm Keevil, walked into the university uh, researcher's uh, office one day. His name was Rudy Hearing. We're talking about the 1980s. Um, and said, what, do you, what kind of technologies do you have that we can commercialize? And um, he goes, I have this lithium ion battery technology. It was a moly disulfide cathode material and he doped it to make um, like the, the lattice a little bit more open so that he can fit more lithium in for charging and discharging. And they um, started a battery company called Molly Energy. It's still here, but, it's, but it's, what happened was it had a lithium metal anode and a moly disulfide doped cathode. And they were making batteries for cell phones and the lithium metal was unstable. And it actually, in Japan, one, f one flown actually caught, lit, on caught on fire and burnt somebody. And unfortunately, within a few months, the, the company went bankrupt basically. But they, they were taken over multiple times and now they're still in production now using different chemistries. They're still in Vancouver now. Wow. That, that's a little known history. The um, graduate student at the time was Jeff Don. He's well known in the battery, um, battery industry. He's, he's a professor in Dalhousie, you know, so that's, there's a lot wow. of history in metals in, in Canada and uh, particularly in Vancouver. And that's, that's kind of why we heard just a, a lot of the, um, the techniques on how you properly extract metals in, in industry um, is taught here in, uh, in Vancouver for, for probably four generations now of professors that are, that are, mm. that are taught. So. Um, so obviously the point we've scaled to now, uh, just to quickly explain battery recycling, I think when generally there's a lot of nuances in battery recycling and how that's actually defined, we see there, it's, it's like broken up in stages, you know, we call it stage one and stage two. Um, many, I guess, Tesla fans or EV fans will think what happens to the end of life of my battery, like the battery pack or the module or the cell. And how that's defined as recycling, there could be the physical shredding of the material and an actual separation, whether it's magnetic separation, density separation. And, and you're, just, you're just taking apart a, lo a lot of those major components, whether it's the plastics, the casing, and then you'll get down to the cathodes and anodes, which are all shredded down into what's known as the black mass. So stage one can be more defined as that actual shredding component. And we're seeing a lot of that, especially in North America and Europe, the production of black mass. And then this black mass is actually just being shipped over primarily to Asia to be refined down further and, and make the products to go back into batteries, right? Like black mass doesn't just go back into a lithium ion battery. You need to go through multiple leaching, refining, purification steps. So what we're focused on is actually that step, taking that black mass, taking that battery production scrap and refining it down into, and like Norm was saying, that final product, which would be precursor cathode active material and lithium hydroxide. And uh, we'll explain a little bit more of those details, but we do this in a minimal amount of steps. Uh, and that material that we have produced, we've sent to you know, multiple industry players who've taken that material and made new battery cells out of it, tested the physical characteristics, tested the electrochemical performance of those cells. And what we've shown is that we've actually even been able to outperform 
Um, virgin material, really? Virgin materials, yeah. Perform at the level or even outperform the virgin materials. And this is going directly from black mass to that end product. So the old lithium ion batteries, the, the main ones were lithium cobalt, lithium cobalt oxide. I don't know if you heard right, of that. Yeah, yeah. So those, and then there was lithium manganese oxide. Right. Those two batteries were very easy to make. So for your iPhone, your uh, notebook computers, they're suitable. Lithium cobalt oxide was very good for storing high energy, but not very good at high power discharge. So they weren't the best batteries for EVs. And then lithium manganese oxide was the opposite. They were good for high power discharge, but they didn't store a lot of energy. But they're very easy to make. You just add cobalt oxide and lithium carbonate, heat treat it, and you can make the cathode material very easily. The latest generation batteries for EVs are changing so much, and they're very fine-tuned materials. So you, you'll probably heard of NMCs and yeah, yeah. NCAs. They're basically a precision-made, perfect material, like microscopically perfect. If you look at, if you look on a microscope, you'll see like perfectly round balls of um, precise um, uh, particle size distribution, surface area, tap density, and you have to make them in a fine-tuned manner. So you have to precipitate them very slowly in a, in a specialized reactors, which we'll show you, we have them here. Um, but it's just because of EVs and this latest generation of material, which is changing very fast as well. Like the, the ratios of the different metals, the different type of metals, the, the particle size are, are just precisionly made. And that's, that's why there's so much scrap. They're just hard yeah. to make. Yeah. You're, you're almost operating at the um, limits of sensors. Like you're, because you can't just precipitate particles instantly. You have to like slowly grow them precisionly. And that's, that's, why, that's why there's so much scrap at this point in time. Yeah, so like now if we look at that, we have production scrap as being that predominant source for recycling and then as well uh, end of life vehicles. But for this plant where we start, you know, designed for 500 kilograms per day input capacity. So you're talking about like production scrap or that material I talked more about is like black mass. That contains lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt, right? And, and the purpose is to first, you know, separate those, those valuable materials. And with the production scrap, um, it's, it's kind of, it's still on the aluminum electro foil. Right. And this stage here, what we call more of like a pre-leach stage is, is a separation of that active material from the aluminum. Um, and as far as black mass, you know, that goes directly into our leaching stage. So um, there's a whole bunch of announcements. We're making these great big gigantic battery plants and, um, and they're based on a chemistry. Uh, and, and quite frankly, the world's changing quite a bit. You've already mentioned that yeah. all mm -hmm. these different uh, um, uh, crystalline uh, formations and whatnot are, are changing a lot. So how smart is it to make a great big giant gigafactory plant to make a battery that may be uh, useless uh, or next to useless or at least out of date in, uh, in the five years that it's going to take to make the factory uh, up. So, well, got an answer on that one? I, yeah, I do. Um, oh, good. So, actually, it's, like, it's changing so fast. Like, all these uh, chemistries yeah. in, in the last five years, it's right. like, oh, I wouldn't say monthly basis, but oh, in yeah, several it months it's oh, changing. No, if you look around the world, monthly basis yeah. is correct. And, and we'll, we'll show you like how <laughs> the cathode material is made, but, but generally speaking, the chemistry is changing, the particle size is changing, but if you were in to do the manufacturing, even with, with those cathode, what we call cathode material, cathode precursors, they all look the same. So the same manufacturing equipment, you basically coat the materials, like all that machinery is the same. Or, or the um, introduction of the electrolyte, the anode, like it's, it's, very, it's very adaptable. Like just the, the, the raw materials that go into the battery look, look the same, even though they're microscopically different. Hmm. So let me ask you a second question then. So if, if I build this great big giant factory, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter mm, uh, what the chemistry or the crystalline structure is going to be. Uh, the machines are all going to be the same. I'm just going to change 
whatever the coating material yeah. is. So I got yeah. another question. Um, uh, I've been a big fan of cylindrical batteries. Um, people are saying, no, 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 everything has to be either prismatic or, or pouch. Yeah. Which is the easiest to extract from? Which is in, the, in terms of the, uh, the recycling? In, in, in terms of recycling. It almost makes no difference. No because, difference. Yeah, because you basically produce it into black mass afterwards <coughs> and then and then it just goes through our hydro, it makes, makes no difference. The, the part I really want to emphasize is, is, you know, recycling is still defined, like we're defined as recyclers, but also making the black mass is defined as a recycler. Yeah. Comes up with two totally different value points uh, and, and what's being offered in the industry. Um, but one point I want to stress, and on that note with the solvents, like the reason Tesla's doing that is to, they just looked at the supply chain, they looked at the whole process, and they said like, why, why are we, using this much processed water, this many steps, when we could just cut, like what if we could just cut all of that out? And similar to what Norm was saying as well as like reducing steps. And I think that's really a key point in our process because whether it's black mass or production scrap, right, it has lithium, nickel, manganese, and cobalt. And I think what we see a lot in the industry or uh, with different processes is when it comes to extracting those materials, they'll look at extracting the individual materials. They'll make nickel sulfate, Cobalt sulfate. I think we've seen all this, and you know, a lot. You'll, you'll see the little, you know, crystal-like yeah. material. So you're extracting those into nickel sulfate, cobalt sulfate, whether it's, uh, you know, lithium carbonate, and and then really the next step, you have to recombine them again to make precursor cathode active material, and then you have to combine that with lithium. And so we just kind of ask the question, like, why go through all of those steps to extract the individual materials, only to have them go back into a material again. So what we've done instead is after leaching and cleaning up that solution of any impurities, we just go directly to the precursor cathode active material. Wow. So it's the mixed nickel, manganese, and cobalt. Yeah. We, we can make, you know, NMC 811. We've made as high as, you know, the really? next generation, like 90% nickel kind of uh, precursors. Uh, you know, we can adjust that material, but we don't have to individually extract them, right? That's to us, a waste of steps, a waste of energy, a waste of wow, resources. Cool. So it really cuts down on that. And going directly to the precursor, when you look at it from a value perspective, is you know what the individual, like the intermediate metal sulfates sell for versus what the precursor is just a, a multiple higher as well. But I have another question. Uh, a lot of these uh, battery componentry or alloys really don't like each other. And how do you keep them from, how does black mass keep from catching on fire, exploding, or having some kind of reaction no, with really? its... I can, uh, I, can, I can answer that. Well, so, so the most reactive thing in the uh, lithium ion battery, the reason why they explode is mainly the electrolyte is, yeah, is what's right. called a non-aqueous organic electrolyte, and it's highly flammable. So when they're making the black mass, there's a couple of things they do in the black mass manufacturing. So they either do the um, like the um, shredding in an inert, inert environment, or they completely discharge them first. So there's there's two things they do to make, and that's and that's in the making of the black mass. Once it gets to here, all the organics have been kind of removed. So we're dealing with the black mass that has been shredded material that has gone through heat treatment to basically burn off the organics. Um, and when it gets to this stage, we don't have that, that issue anymore. I see, I see. But when we're coming and leaching the materials, right, like you'll see this, there's a, the leach, leach circuit we have here, so the four cascading tanks. Um, so originally I know we designed, we said it was designed for 500 kilograms per day. Uh, the leaching here, that's really kind of your uh, limiting factor in the efficiency you can get, because that's where the reaction really has to occur. And we've actually pushed that even over 800 kilograms of, uh, of throughput. Uh, so it was, it was quite efficient even at the scale from the original design at smaller scale. And then once we go through the leach, right, you have this pregnant leach solution that has the material but also has impurities. So one, one thing we do separate is, you know, the base metals like nickel, manganese, and cobalt from lithium. Um, and then that will be going through its own co-precipitation stage. And like I mentioned, that, that then moves on to making the precursor material. And then through that, through that Point, if we compare to conventional hydrometallurgical recycling processes, instead of just this step, uh, what they'll go through is like multiple 
solvent extraction steps. So solvent extraction right. and crystallization where you're targeting nickel, you're crystallizing that, making nickel sulfate, you're targeting cobalt, and you're going through all those stages. So that, I mean, I don't think that would be able to fit in this space, right? That just requires a lot more of a footprint as well. And you're making an intermediate product at the end of the day. I'll have Norm explain what we got going on over here. Well, that's but, one thing, I, and I also have never seen anything like that well, before just, either. That's, that's so, pretty much a standard yeah, filter Norm, press. In a, in a really? That's a filter press? Back. It's a filter press in the mining industry. And uh, I, know, I know, I guess you asked a question about the efficiency in the motors, but it's way more efficient than mining because yeah, crushing, right. especially crushing rocks, that's the, that's yeah. the biggest yeah, right. energy intensive right. aspect of, of actual mining. But our feed is surprisingly, we talk about impurities and everything, but it's a super concentrated feed material yeah. and already like broken down to fine particles. Um, it's basically a, a miner's dream. It's, you have the, yeah. the perfect material that goes into a, a mining yeah. process. But um, yeah, you, you showed you the filter press here, but um, yeah, so we're, uh, that we're, yeah, so so basically in our technology, we're it's like we're trying to re recycle as much as we can the water. Uh, this one actually regenerates the chemicals, so we're making uh, lithium hydroxide and sulfuric acid. We're splitting a salt basically, so you have lithium sulfate from the process after you've taken out the base metals, and then um, what we're doing here is. Uh, we're putting the lithium sulfate through cells and we apply electricity and the lithium goes through one way, the sulfate goes the other way, you make sulfuric acid and lithium hydroxide from splitting the salt. Mm. This is kind of the prototypes that we made, but we've, we've worked a lot in this industry. Um, so this is a, enables us to recycle the reagents and, and make lithium hydroxide. Just. Uh, and I think another point, Norm, we should yeah. point out is that in, in the industry, I think you've probably heard it as well, that sodium sulfate is going to be a huge problem. I think in yeah. recycling, you probably, in a conventional method, you produce more sodium sulfate than the actual products you're making. And I think... Yeah, this, this is kind of like the, the latest generation of our technology. So uh, it's just Im like improvement and uh, of the patents that we've uh, originally filed yeah. for. And yeah. it just making a more elegant uh, processing plant. Yeah. Part, part of our technology, I mean, the insides are proprietary. So when we talk about the precursor making, right, that's, so that's kind of, you know, when it, when it all ties in and we have that really purified solution where, you know, this is, this is really that next generation piece of making the precursor material. So we talked about lithium hydroxide, uh, this will make the precursors, so whether it's NMC 811, 9X, 622, uh, you know, you can, you can adjust your feed solution. Mm -hmm. So you can adjust, you know, the nickel, manganese, cobalt composition. And th this really, when you think of it, so the product coming out of here and the product coming out of there, so lithium hydroxide and precursor, that's really as final of a product as it gets. It's now just combining those two to make your cathode active material and coat it on. So, um, talking about our business model where we're looking to actually be integrated at the, at the Gigafactory site. Yeah. You know, you're making a product that can effectively go back to the front end. It's not the intermediate. Because even, for example, let's say with some of our competitors, they're making nickel sulfate or cobalt sulfate. Like, there's no cam manufacturing in North America as of, as of now. Yeah. Like, that material is still being shipped to Asia. It's being refined into the high value product that we would be making here and then it gets sent back to you to actually make the battery cells. So you can see the, how many steps we're cutting out just from a business side yeah. of things and a technical side of things. Um, so yeah, mul multiple steps around here, but it's really a uh, you know, customized, uh, customized piece of equipment um, uh, that I don't believe there's much expertise in North America and outside of this facility that really knows how to operate this uh, effectively. That certainly looks impressive, I must say. When I looked at it, I was thinking, maybe they make beer as well, but uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very precision, chem precision chemical reactors that you're operating at the limits of certain sensors, just so that you can make those microscopic, perfect 
round round balls yeah. of uh, cathode material and so just had, uh, where, where, chemistry. Where where do you even buy this equipment? Is this like is this off the? Because I am not a chemist. Yeah, no. It's, and uh, we do have you, two mine. Well, we have a mining company in lots of different locations yeah. that we work with. This is. But this I've is never seen anything like this. Yeah, it's just you have to. I mean, uh, we have an expert in battery materials here. It's yeah. Our VP. Um, but basically, it's custom designed and you know custom ordered, and then the operation of it is. Um, there's a significant amount of know-how as well, just how you operate yeah. these things. Yeah, so th this is just gonna be a scale, you know, at a smaller scale as well. We've produced dozens of samples yeah. of, uh, of uh, the precursor material and, and the different So who's your biggest well. customer now? Or are you allowed to? Oh, well, we're, we're under, we're, we're, we're a publicly traded company. I mean, we're as transparent as they can get with uh, any news that we have out there. Um, but also I think, our, our, our business model leads us to a route where there's a lot of technical due diligence under NDAs versus just being kind of that service provider that's you know signing mm -hmm. deals and get, getting rid of waste for companies. We're really focused on like long-term partnership building. Um, and you know, a lot of companies don't want to disclose that right away until yeah. they're, they're ready to uh, yeah. make a move. Essentially like what you saw in the back, this is now, you know, we're getting smaller samples We're you know, working with different companies just sending us smaller test samples at first to to try out and um you know this would be called bench scale or lab scale to work on the material right so you know we'll send you know this is precursor material so when i talked about like if we took a like a microscopic image of this you'll see like perfectly spherical shaped balls or the, the little spheres um uh, it, it'll have specific distribution they'll all be let's say within like the mm. you know, eight to 12 micron range. So this is for a customer, right? This will be NMC811 precursor and lithium hydroxide. And this would be to a battery grade to their specification. And then the, what they would do with this is start making cells, uh, doing multiple charge and discharge cycles, um, you know, testing, testing its performance. Mm. And, and this is all part of that validation step of, uh, you know, can we potentially integrate this recycling technology alongside our you know yeah. future battery manufacturing investments the big reactor you saw um, this is the the smaller scale of that there's the techniques in being able to operate this uh, it's it's very specialized and like i said i think you won't you won't find many of these uh, in north america especially at this scale or even at the the larger scale do you make your own equipment or how do you where there's, do you get this stuff from there's a lot of customization to it. Yep. Um, some, some equipment we make, some, sometimes we just order parts and we, we put it together ourselves. Uh, or we'll design, design mm -hmm. the, the process and we'll just order pieces of equipment that we put together ourselves. Um, yeah. But this, this is actually, it looks relatively simple, but it's very, it's actually very specialized how you operate this, this machinery. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, you have to run it 24 hours a day. And then the first, the first few days, you basically have a, a waste. You have to like discharge it. And then, uh, and then, and then you, you hit steady state, and you're producing the, the stuff that goes to customers. Basically, yeah, that's what you're collecting. Yeah. And and every every half hour, we'll do a, like a test on it as well, just to make sure that we don't stray from the conditions. You know, it's funny when uh, <clears throat> when Ford Co Ford Motor Company was basically dominating the, the car market, um, they made all of their own equipment. Mm -hmm. They did not buy from. There was no such thing as a tool shop that would sell to Ford or yeah. a machine shop that would make parts for Ford. Ford did everything on their own. Um, that was the, the whiz kids, again, back to uh, the East Coast mentality. But anyways, the whiz kids said, oh, get rid of that car. And as soon as they did that, they immediately lost uh, a tremendous amount of their ability to, uh, to develop new machine tools and automation and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, so having it I, if I if I had your business, I would never ship any of that. I would. This looks like something I could buy from a uh, 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 supply store, and it looks <laughs> like you cut it out to do whatever you're going to do on the inside, welded a spigot on it and whatnot, and now it becomes your machine, using um, standard off-the-shelf componentry. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd 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 have my own division of uh, making yeah making making the machines that make the product. 
Well, everybody, I'd like to thank the folks here at Recyclico for uh, giving us an absolutely brilliant tour. I'd like to thank you for the, my new book here. You're welcome. Joey is uh, the author here. And uh, we'll put up uh, a little note to say how you can buy it um, if you're a chemist. <laughs> Anyhow, or a chemical engineer. Anyway, this has been phenomenal. Uh, I think this is going to be one of the highest viewed things we've ever put out. I'd like to thank you guys sincerely. This has been brilliant. It really has. Um, keep watching Monroe Live and, uh, and have a wonderful day, bearing in mind that all those batteries can be recycled, but mostly it's going to be just a scrap in manufacturing that's going to make it all happen. Get the book and you'll see the answers. Thanks so much. Bye.